watching my husband who was accused of a crime he didn't commit and the battles that we fought. Uh, he was in prison for five months, but he, um, when he came home, we still had many years of that legal battle. And part of that legal battle is they finding $280,000, no longer have a medical license. He, um, so we were at ground zero physically, monetarily, and emotionally. And uh, we had our baby, and we just spent as much time as we could to heal. But my body was in a chronic state of maladaptive stress. I lived in a really, really elevated state of the sympathetic nervous system that became very dominant. So I lived every second just always on the alert. And I remember when I was a young child, when I was in classes and hearing things about how stress kills or how stress breaks down the body, and it didn't really make sense to me as to how and why that's the case. I understand much more now about how that maladaptive stress response is a lot of pressure on the body, how you know, growing a baby is, takes the most energy, digestion is the next thing that takes the most energy, but that stress response adds uh, all of the adrenaline and cortisol that is constantly pumping through the body, that it, tension that the body's always held in, whether your primary um, stress response is run, fight, or hide, or fawn, uh, whatever that is, those organs take a hit. Your body takes a hit and it just continues to break down. We spent a great deal of time trying to heal. We did every healing modality we could find. And one of them was we went to uh, Peru in 2012. I was in, I, I, I didn't ever have a moment where I didn't have this chronic knot in my stomach. It just felt like this boulder. I felt like my stomach was being eaten from the inside. Uh, I shook all the time, really quite violently. By the time I had my near-death experience, <coughs> um, my life at that time was, I was bedridden. Uh, I became violently reactive to nearly 500 foods. Um, I shook quite intense uh, about eight to 10 hours a day and it wasn't just like mild shaking, it was violently shaking. Um, so to the point where I would almost shake off the bed <coughs> and uh, just incredibly weak and frail. So it was clear my body was breaking down and having a near death experience that I'll share uh, at the end of this, I'm going to share just a 10 minute blip about what that was like. But uh, the journey back, coming back into my body, uh, it was two weeks, it took me two, I couldn't, I was so weak I couldn't even speak. So it was two weeks after my near death experience that my husband even knew. I, no, I couldn't, I didn't have any energy to talk. And when I would try to talk, apparently my voice was very garbled and quiet and so I could see that everybody would lean in and try to understand and they'd put their ear right to my mouth and it was so much energy for me to communicate uh, any message like can I have a glass of water or anything like that uh, nobody could understand me and so and to just try to say anything one of the things that I really recognized is how much energy it takes for the body to communicate and Anybody who knows in the spirit realm, their communication is telepathically, you don't use the primitive language, because it does take a lot of your vital energy. Uh, I was still bedridden for an additional eight months, and uh, it was really, really challenging, uh, to say the least. But I also know that uh, I contracted for this experience. Some of the backstory about that is when I was five, my mom had a very similar experience, uh, different circumstances, but my mom nearly died and was in and out of the hospital for two years. And she was under an enormous amount of stress. She had a nervous breakdown and her body continued to break down. And I remember, I cogn I, I'm very cognizant of the moment when I would watch my mom. And I remember saying to myself, I wonder if I'm going to survive when this happens to me. And how I knew that was going to happen, I don't know if it was the chicken or the egg. I just either, I created it or somehow my spirit knew that that journey was going to be mine as well. On the plus side of my mom having that experience, she became
became an advocate when my family kept saying, why aren't you in the hospital? Why hasn't Scott healed you? Why are you still sick? Why are you still sick? Why are you still sick? And I didn't have a voice to even explain why I was still sick. I didn't know all the answers either. Although we ran multiple blood tests and had many, many tests, and, and we found that I had H. pylori and E. coli in my gut, I had severe leaky gut, uh, that I also had a lot of viruses and uh, bacteria in my gut. So from that language, that was still taking place. I had parasites for sure too. Um, so on the physical level, I had a lot of those things, but none of them compared to the emotional state of the trauma that my brain and body's maladaptive stress response was like. So uh, I feel that it took me a long time to feel grateful for this experience. I felt very victimized, very isolated, very alone. Um, it wasn't, it didn't feel fair. We felt like, I, I felt like we had already endured an absolute hell and I was still carrying that hell and I just wanted to escape my body. And the, the way I would describe when somebody asked me my pain level, on a scale of one to 10, it was a 27. I mean, it was so incredibly uh, daunting to have that level of physical pain that my, I know that my stress response is to fawn, and make everybody else okay, and to run. Those are my two uh, responses. And we all have a combination of whatever those stress responses were but I wanted to run away from my body. I wanted to escape my body. I wanted to go back, and yet I knew I had to stay here and raise my family. But uh, I had learned meditation years earlier and wasn't really, uh, I, I, I wasn't, it's something that I maintained all of the time, but was, I would try to meditate. And I remember thinking as a young mom, if I'm ever sick or have the flu, I'm just gonna use that time to focus on my healing and manifest great health and, and, and uh, meditate and just use that time to, for self-love. However, when you're in so much physical pain, that's just not even an option. And when you're in a high level stress response, your brain is firing at such high intensity that it's hard to just slow that down. And when I would try to meditate, uh, it caused me to put more focus on the physical body, which only increased the pain. So that was just not sustainable for me. In that, in that pain level though, one of the things we did, when we went to some mindfulness training, some classes, just trying to just calm the body. I would try to get body work, just my nerves would just be so intense. And it was a real huge awakening for me that when I had those desires to run away from the body, that my spirit would escape the body. I had great compassion that whether I was, my consciousness was present or not, my body still had to endure this. And uh, I recognized that I had to ride this train and for whatever level that was going to be. What I developed from this experience is enormous compassion for the journey of what a person is capable of experiencing. Great empathy for somebody who has been on a healing journey and a deeper understanding of our soul's purpose. I know that my own gifts as in, my, in, in the healing fields uh, was, I, I was the archetype of the wounded healer, which you have so many wounds that you can't imagine allowing somebody else to go through that unassisted and so, you rise up out of this and as the uh, as a desire to help assist others, which I've been grateful that I've been present with other people in their healing journey because they felt seen and heard. And I think that's something we all desire is to be seen for who we are, to be validated for where we're at in our life, and to be heard at the challenges that we've had and that somebody hears your voice. Uh, the chapter that I'm the most proud of in this whole book, uh, it starts as my near-death experience and then the convalescence and struggle. Um, my very dear friend, when I was so sick and I just kept looking for every avenue I could find and I knew that I had, I had a friend in, in Australia who worked with the Aboriginal people and I felt hopeful that she may have some insight that we didn't have in this Western world. And I had sent her a message and about an hour later, she responded.
responded back and said that convalescence is not something that our, that our Western world allows and uh, that to allow this time to, to take the time to heal. And honestly, uh, my association with the word convalescence at that moment was just like a geriatric home or what we see back in the 50s or 60s where all these people are laying in these beds out in the sun and soaking up the sun and it was just my association not really understanding that it was allowing the proper time for healing. So in that allowing for the proper time to heal, I, when I received that message, I, um, I, I was still so weak, I really wasn't able to walk at that time. And so I slithered off my bed. I was alone in my, in my home. Uh, and I had my, our little dog that sat beside me the whole time, just holding space. But it took me 20 minutes to crawl down the hall and around into our library and to pull off the book uh, that was our dictionary off the, off the bookshelf and to read what convalescence meant. And it exhausted my body to do that. And I just laid on the floor and wept and just absolutely wept that I needed that time to heal and was not uh, able to do so at the level that was necessary. <clears throat> but my book, my book journeys from my near-death experience and then this convalescence and what my day-to-day -day life was like and then going down the rabbit hole into the healing paradigm and recognizing that thoughts are things, are, uh, that trauma resides in the body. We all try to fix our world from the physical level we, and when any time there's been a breakdown, it's a natural inclination to address the physical body and whatever the symptoms are in the physical body. But somebody who has been on that journey will recognize that that is the last domino that, that falls, that we have to back up the truck and go back to what caused this in the first place. And it's always going to have some emotional component. And uh, you cannot heal in a sympathetic stress response. Your body is designed to run, fight, or hide. And that's why uh, people will often purge their bowels, their, their digestion doesn't take place because like I said, it takes an enormous amount of energy to digest food and uh, that, that all of the blood goes to the limbs to help us to run, fight, or hide. But the parasympathetic is our rest and regeneration and I just didn't reside in that space at all. And so I show, uh, there's a number of chapters, not only about nutrition, because obviously nu nutrition is a very key component. I needed to rebuild my gut, and the lining of my gut, but I also needed a lot of nutrition to rebuild the myelin sheath around my nervous system, to strengthen my vagus nerve. And uh, I would say the things that helped me the most in my healing journey uh, was bone broth. Bone broth was really helpful with the amino acids and make it really bioavailable. It was very helpful with nutri nu nutrient density. And uh, so that was the nourishment that I could have. Uh, spiritually, uh, I tapping, uh, which I have a chapter on this. And right now I'm actually um, in training. I'll, I'll be a clinical uh, practitioner with EFT. Uh, within the year, so I'm really excited. I've always done the basic, and I have a whole chapter about tapping and the benefits of that. And then uh, also essential oils for the emotional component. Essential oils have been a very key player for that, helping. Uh, there's a lot of science about why that was so beneficial uh, for the brain and to help support either the upregulation or the downregulation of the gene expression. And then, uh, so I'll, my book has a lot of that information because I, I feel like many authors will write a book with a vision of who, they're writing, who their audience is. And my audience that I, that I focused on was the young mom at home trying to raise her family and sick in bed, too weak and fragile without resources, going to doctor after doctor after doctor and either being told that it was in their head or being told that they were a hypochondriac or being told that they didn't have the answers and always leaving yourself uh, more confusion, more pain, uh, and, and
and then worthiness tends to step in, thinking, at, at, and, and often uh, victim mentality tends to, to seep in as well. And so uh, then I move, the very last chapter is, my, is the chapter for caregivers, and that's the chapter that I feel I've had the most feedback on. Uh, the caregiver support, I feel, is a, a huge shadow in our world that there's a lot of attention on the actual patient, of course, and there's a conversation around healing. There's a lot of people who focus on the healing, but very, very little is said to the people who are carrying the heavy lifting, and that is watching loved ones who are very weak and fragile. Uh, and Scott and I have been in a really interesting experience in our life that we both watched the other nearly die, and we both watched the other spend years on the healing paradigm. And when my husband was really sick and nearly died in 2017 um, due to an infection in his head, there was about a year and a half that every single, every single day, I didn't know whether he was going to wake up the next morning. And going to sleep at night holding his hand, thinking this might be it. And that level of pain and trauma and having nobody in your world who has ever been there is really isolating. And same thing with the near-death experience or being very, very sick. Nobody understands. They don't have the network to understand. They may have a level of compassion, but they truly don't have an understanding. There, there can be knowledge of what somebody's experiencing, and then somebody who's been through that before will have the wisdom the wisdom to be able to hold space and have an encompassing compassion for the individual and to truly see them. So my caregiver guide at the end of the book is uh, really profound and it shares, I share a lot of the do's and don'ts and beautifully I learned all of that in my own experience because uh, we lived in a very nice neighborhood at that time that was predominantly LDS it was predominantly upper, upper crust, and uh, there was a lot of attention on uh, things that really didn't matter. There was a lot of Joneses, and uh, we were in our home with young children and with a mother in bed, and nobody knocked on our door asking if they could help. Nobody offered a meal for my child or children, and I felt really abandoned. And I went at a time that I felt like I would show up for so many other people, but I felt abandoned in my hour of need. And that uh, really caused me to understand that when somebody is on any journey, whether they've lost a loved one, whether they have a, a, a family member who is receiving some kind of medical treatment, or they are witnessing somebody in a, chron in a chronic or terminal illness, the weight, and that, the, the weight of that on the, on the body and the emotions and just being held in that chronic stasis uh, is it's similar to watching some, you know, waiting for a baby to be born. It's just, it disrupts, it's never an ideal time and watching waiting for somebody to die. It's just, it, 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 you, you hold, put your whole life on hold. And uh, the, so you're held in that grief and not allowing to process the grieving of loss or pain or emotional trauma until we're at the end point. And sometimes that end point is many, many months. And so uh, that's why the caregiver section is really important to me about and where I share how to show up and what not to do. And so uh, that I feel like is something that definitely needs a voice. So on that, uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions or, or any more that I could share, but yes. You can go ahead. I think it's interesting you made the um, point that this gave you the hardness, uh, the hardship that you had to go through with all of this actually brought out all this compassion. And I think of the stories I've heard of when there's a great catastrophe around the world or whatever that instead of people being rude, they become a lot more concerned. Yeah. They ju it just naturally comes out of them. That's beautiful. Yeah, I agree. And and uh, there's there's a famous 